Good evening. Um, if you want to take a seat at any one of the tables, that's where we'll start. Uh, I'm Amita Snyder, a proud Edison Creative Writing alumnus, and I, along with the Edison community, am pleased to welcome you to an evening with the Miami Valley Poets. Thank you for embracing and supporting not only these poets, but also the potential that each one of you has as an artist of language. In the introduction of Rhyme and Rune, Poets of the Miami Valley, the editor explains that the ideas, perceptions, and confessions of the poets may provide useful starting points for other poets or aspiring poets, perhaps even people who didn't know they were poets until they leave here this evening. As part of the Miami Valley community, each of us is familiar with the vast inspiration that can be found here from the landscape, the folklore, and the rich history of the area. The poets we have here tonight have drawn from that heritage to create a book of poetry about poetry. While one likens poetry to a long lost wanderer needing a place to stay, another likens it to a strong cup of coffee, and still another relates it to a cat in a trap. Regardless of the metaphor, we learn something about the process or product of poetry from each of these gifted poets. Each poem is its own carefully crafted pearl with inherent value, but strung together in book form, rhyme and room becomes an exquisite strand, unique and timeless. We all know the rhyme of poetry, but what of the rune? Runes are ancient symbols or letters, each carrying a deeper meaning beyond the sound it makes. A rune embodies the spirit and energy of its mystical significance. And so it is with poetry. It can be both rhyme and rune. So now, knowing that these poets hold mystical secrets and meanings deeper than the symbols themselves, we invite you to pick their brains and seek meaning for yourself in the pursuit of hidden gems that you can perhaps cultivate into your own pearls of poetry. At this time, we will begin table discussions with the various poets that have joined us. Each table has a facilitator, in an effort to speak with as many poets as possible, we will rotate tables after 15 minutes, and this will happen twice before we come together as a large group to hear some readings from our poets. You may choose any table to start with, and as we rotate, you can go to any table each time we rotate. Um, and now we will begin, and the facilitators will be happy to get you started with discussions. We have had some wonderful conversations at our table, and I trust the same thing was happening at your table. Um, right now, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a few minutes to transition. Um, we're going to have the poets do some readings, so we would love for you to come closer and not seats up front. Feel free to bring your water, your snacks, and in a few minutes, I will be introducing the editor, and he will be introducing the poets. It is always rewarding to hear from our artists about the craft. It gives me more appreciation for what they do and how they do it. And of course, it's even more gratifying to witness their craft. So we have the opportunity to hear these poets read their own work for us. Hearing it aloud from the artists themselves gives deeper insight into the poem in a way that we don't get to usually experience it when we read it ourselves. At this time, I would like to introduce the editor of the Lime and Room, Poets of the Miami Valley. Steve Brody, also a poet, lives in the country outside Cedarville, Ohio, with his wife Susan, who is a sculptor. His chapbooks, Earth Inside Them, and Necessary Deceptions, were published by Main Street Rat Publishing, as was a previous collection entitled From the Tower, Poetry in Honor of Conrad Valiet, which Brody edited. He is an emeritus professor of education at both Missouri State University and Wittenberg University. Steve will be introducing our poets this evening. Please welcome Steve Brody. Thank you. I just want to thank Vivian uh, so much for organizing this. I know it must have been an awful lot of work, and we are very grateful. 
that chance to showcase um, the best of Miami Valley poets is, is just wonderful. And working with this group of poets has been one of the, the really neat things that's happened to me. Uh, what I'm going to ask is that uh, when I call you up, uh, you want to say a few words about yourself? That's fine. Go ahead. Because we had real short little blurbs in here. But I would appreciate it if you would read maybe one or two of the poems this time. Uh, if it's a real long poem, one, a couple short ones, that, that'll be fine. That way, nobody's going to have uh, the need to get up and walk away. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we'll have a good time. I'm going to do this in reverse alphabetical order tonight because some people always get the first and some people always stop being last. So I'm going to ask Carol Polk to come on up first. of my consciousness, where unrelated thoughts bubble randomly to the surface, fresh poetry begins to percolate. Its phrases sit down to the dark rich realms of my creativity, to the thin paper filter of my writing skill, and drift slowly into the crap of a poetic stanza. Because the filter is not always perfect, and the grounds are not always fresh, some of the phrases splatter onto the counter in a wasteful spill needing to be wiped up and thrown away. While others continue to brew into a flow of liquid language, full-bodied and flavorful, now poured into a mug as a delicious poem, seeming at least to please my taste buds. With both hands cupped around its sides, I sit slowly and savor every word, hoping it is rich enough to serve for a morning brunch. Carol, is there some better way for the microphone, I, I'd say maybe what some people were thinking. There was, there was echo or oh, was something. There? Would it help if somebody held the microphone or? Do you think it, you think it went a little farther away from? from I don't know. I don't, I don't know what you want. I don't know what you think. Okay. Two. Closer, okay. Now I'll just read. Um, well, it's just published in another journal um, called White Dress Press. This one I've written about uh, churches. My mother said that. It's still. Oh, of course, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm not technologically or so. This one's called Pendulous. For several weeks outside the window of my, by my mother's bed, a branch dangled from high in the neighbor's oak tree splinter off from a limb. No longer upright enough to hold a nest or sprout a leaf, yet not detached enough to succumb to the wind. Its twigs stretched like fingers toward the ground, while sunlight rested quietly on, on the struggle. I used to hold my mother in my care, but she could no longer hold me in hers, though she never stopped trying. Her warmth still rests quietly in my heart.
sure I'm calm about that because, you know, as well, I, yeah, okay, you'll see. All right. You should write a poem about that, they say, and I cringe because, well, let's be honest, it implies that this is easy. As if any topic, even one given by someone who was newly introduced at a friend's birthday party, back when there were birthday parties, could send me into that huge state where a poem is writing me. Those moments where fireflies in my mind translate to words on a page that I don't even remember writing. And yeah, maybe the fact that the man who is restoring the turkeys on the historic arcade building is the grandson of the man who originally built them is amazing, but that's more of a human interest story and not something I pick up my pen about. Truthfully, though, I couldn't tell you what my type of poetry is anymore. And with it nearing 10 o'clock, and this deadline was shaking in my ears, and then my wife made me downstairs to begin our nightly COVID ritual of one more dead last so episode. And me without an idea, the next time the science teacher nudges me in a faculty meeting and says, You should write a poem about that, I swear I'll write it out. And this short poem is about Joe, our moderator was so kind and, and did a lot of work finding out about our backgrounds and that kind of thing. So I was able to talk a little bit about my background in Buffalo. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and uh, was about city, and so a lot of my writing is kind of muscular in that way. Um, this is a short poem called The Child in Point Silver. When a street light breaks, I coax its mercury into a Dixie cup to paint myself silver. Nightly, I sluice quicksilver from palm to palm, my light, watching my lifeline drown under its weight. Every time I pour the liquid mirror back into the cup, there is less of me reflected. When only the bee remains, I swirl it around the bottom as if quickening minutes on the clock, and then pull it into my navel that I am metal fed. Listen, I say, I can float steel on my surface. Look at my coat of shine. Thank you. 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 A particular way of looking at the world as if it was something else, something familiar, intimately familiar to them. And look out for me as we go along because you might get this. I would like to invite Herb Martin to come forward. Herb is uh, sort of our eminent degree of poets in the, in the whole Miami Valley. He is a multi talented and not, not only writes, but does music. Just about anything else you can think of. Can you hear me now? Yes. Do you do that? I was born in Alabama, and so we don't want to take it. You have to know the South to understand that joke. Anyway, <clears throat> I've been practicing because one of the things that I try to get my students when I taught to do was to find somebody who could talk to them about writing and who could criticize them when they failed to pay attention. Uh, and, and one of the hard things is being a poet you don't often take time into criticism, you know, uh, and that's one of our faults. And you have to outgrow that, I think. So, uh, not to be sure that I am saying what I need to say, I'm going to read you. Um, I'll be doing the, the, the new poem, and then I'll read you the old poem. I think I am 
Bu yol dersin. Değer beyin, you know, English, I don't mean the square word, but I mean this. When you damn your ears with your index finger, you will hear the inexorable march of malaria, advancing like a giant fever, preparing to confront Jack over his long and active fever, over those objects we consider the finer things in life. That confrontation, that confrontation, finally took place because the giant was at birth, deceived by what he smelled. His nose told him the truth. His housekeeper, on the other hand, threw a veil of sweet words over the exposure that he had smelled the blood of an Englishman. He made a full escape twice, but like the flyer, the fly flew into the ointment. The heart was not to be silent. He insisted that the giant wake up to the truth. Then it was incumbent upon him, the giant, to make every diligent effort to retrieve the treasures he had lost. And in doing so, he gave up that final treasure, life. Jane Crescent is an essence. She is well known in 
folks are not here, I can just buy and go and working with her for this book too. Um, I think I can project is not apologize. Just one comment uh, before I begin to read my poem more. Uh, there is a legend about Thomas Wolfe, the novelist, oh, yeah, kind of that he would stand and write on top of the refrigerator. Lay the paper and write. Remember, 1930s refrigerators were small. His hands were too big for a typewriter. More. To start the flow of poetry, I move. Walking my dog works. The steady pace of six feet on asphalt, concrete, grass. The rhythm of heel and toe, go and come, churns the cream of my thoughts into words I mouth. My husband laments that since I've taken up writing poetry, I do ask the strangest questions. Moving around the house, putting away the wash, I taste tidbits of wines and smile for no reason, licking them like mixing spoons. He could not imagine that the sheer joy of writing a poem is like having your breast touch. Filling a notebook, I go from room to room. That moment when everything is possible, when you know you will live forever. Or stand, like Thomas Wolfe, at his refrigerator, hungry. I'd like to read one other poem which was published in a wonderful anthology, Sun and Shadow, Wood and Stone, which was uh, sponsored by the Tecumseh Land Trust in Glen Helen Association. Poetry on the Cabin Porch. At 6 a.m., the cabin is as silent as the shushing of the creek. Even the cats snuggle in. While chocolate, raspberry, coffee, brews, I stretch, savoring the air coming in the kitchen window. In one hand, I take a mug of coffee with whipped cream, a notebook and pen in the other. On the porch, poetry waits. A sprig of mountain laurel twined in her hair, a frond of maiden hair fern caught in her sandal strap. I hurry, she says with a smile. Sliding her hair, her chair close, she takes the coffee and licks the cream from the edge of the mug. I lean in for the fragrance of dew on her neck. She sets down the coffee and lifts my chin in her hand, warm and silky. Her kiss on my forehead lingers for a moment as neither of us breathes, waiting for the words to come. When we settle back, I sip the coffee and begin to write words released by her presence. Soon she grows diaphanous, no more than a reflection in the morning sun, bloody over the hemlock-covered mountain. Can you hear? 
in life. Quoting Mary Oliver from her book, Rules for the Dance. Metrical poetry is about breath. Breath as an intake and flow. Breath as a pattern. Breath as an indicator, perhaps the most vital one, of mood. Breath as our own personal tie with all the rhythms of the natural world, of which we are a part, from which we can never break apart while we live. Breath as our first language. My first sonnet is called At Sea with the Sonnet. Would that be better? At sea with the sonnet. The moon commands, now take a midnight swim. Just dive right in and feel yourself immerse. And so I plunge and pray for safe traverse in lyrics undulating at the brim. Where is the muse? Where are the seraphim? What compass guides across this universe? Afloat, can I convey my thoughts in verse? Can I transform ideas into a hymn? The moon commands, swim to the current's tide. Take measured strokes and feel yourself flex strong. And so I sense the rhythm, sense the rhyme. Syllabic heartbeats with my words belong to nature's pattern, nature's paradigm. I am iambic as I swim my song. The second sonnet, well that one was a Petrarchan sonnet, and the one I will read to you now is the more typical Shakespearean sonnet. And the occasion for this poem was a solstice reading at Glen Helen in Yellow Springs, where there was a sense of community among poets, just as there is here tonight a sense of community among poets. As I read this poem, listen for the title of this anthology, Rhyme and Rune, and listen for the references to the elements of nature which are all around us. Invocation, Glen Helen. We do not fear that briefest time of light, the winter solstice, which occurring soon cannot defy December hopes so bright while poets gather here with rhyme and rune to celebrate forever in the glen where always wind and water, earth and sun remind us of the elements again and their inspiring spirits freely run infusing us with nature's holy muse. The breath of wind, the lyric waterfall, the fertile loam of earth, the flaming news, these forces of the true transcendent all. We humbly offer 
poetry of place because environment is sacred space. And I'll end with a quote again from Mary Oliver, which has to do with that transcendence. And this comes from Mary Oliver's book, Upstream, a collection of her essays. Quote, for the universe is full of radiant suggestions over and over in the butterfly we see the idea of transcendence in the forest we see not the inert but the aspiring in water that departs forever and forever returns we experience eternity and Thank you, Betsy. I hope you noticed that the very fine poem that she read at the end was the source of the title for the book that we have before you this evening. It seemed to me the perfect title. Um, from now on, if you would rather skip the, the microphone, I'll, I'll keep it over here. Uh, I, it's not difficult to project back to you. So we're uh, getting all this feedback off of the off of the stage. That makes it a little tough. Um, Jeremy Green uh, is a member of the Tower Boys. Uh, this was the group um, to be my house every once in a while. And he comes all the way from Dayton uh, to come to Cedarville for, for our meetings. And that in itself shows a real dedication. Um, we really enjoy his poetry, especially what he has to teach us about form and structure of poetry. Oh, thanks. My first poem is called, What Are You Willing to Publish? It's been rejected any number of times from publishers who might have 500 or 800 subscribers while I have close to 5,000 friends on Facebook and 1,200 followers. So I thought I would poke the bear and write this poem. But now that it's been published, I can't submit it anymore. <laughs> a, and to make it even worse, it's a sonnet. Worse because it gets rejected more often. I look for sonnets in your magazine. On every page I search, I glean, I read. Each month I taste its scholarly cuisine to find a morsel, nosh, or tasty seed. Does no one write a sonnet anymore? Or don't you care about this classic form of metered verse that I am looking for to end a broken heart or quell a storm? Experimental verse with awkward phrase is what you publish and I can't digest. With modernistic and obscure essays that are to me of minimal interest. And so today, I ask you this one time, would you print a sonnet with a rhyme? <laughs> Just poke that bear. The next poem comes to my book, White Window, My View of the African American Experience. I'm a member of the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Literary Circle. It meets in the Dunbar House uh, once a month on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, so I wrote this this poem about Generation 7. It's about 160 years since the end of slavery. And if you divide that by 25, it's about seven generations. And so I wrote this poem, Generation 7. Slavery's freed children, Generation 1, born to tragedy and era dark, future bleak, but hope swelled full within their breasts. Emancipation's gilded power fell to lawless men's oppression where rules changed, repression gained, and education stalled. However, generations leaning into the winds struggled with strength unmeasured, success unrecorded. Generation four produced three men, Martin, Medgar, and Malcolm. You know who they are? 
listening for freedom's ring, holding the banner of liberty's march, dreaming of a better day. They had a dream. Refusing to believe the bank of due process could be bankrupt, they looked upon the palace of justice and dreamed of a better day. They observed freedom's broken table, supported by legs of injustice, prejudice, oppression, and inequality, dreaming of overcoming. Urgent cries of oppression unheard by ears lacking resonance remained closed to the sound of truth. Fifty more years slipped away. Two new generations braved the day, sacrificed with blood in military's uniform, believing a system would reform itself. I long to live where I can feel free and confidence, a Generation 5 friend stated. My silence reveals my ignorance of what I hear but have yet to feel. Maybe Canada is where I'll go, he ponders further during lunch that day. But any more than that, he does not say. He seems uncertain, doesn't seem to know. His plight is similar to Generation 4. Generation 7 stands today at Freedom's Door with unique sensitivity not seen before. They understand the rules and play the game. Whiteness reigns with outcomes the same. They're reaching age of contribution, looking for a place to serve with energy and great reserve, pursuing peaceful revolution. They recognize what others cannot see, camouflage behind the cloak of history. Here a statue, there an honor, exalting institutions, silent war. I can't relate, cannot see, I only hear their words, their honest plea. I cannot feel or understand their pain. I seek to know and empathize in vain. I weep for Generation 7. They speak new words, white privilege, undefined by me, unidentified by me till now. I didn't know, now I see it. The fruit stand catches my check because I'm white. The sign says, Cash only, never checks. And there I stand from out of state. The lady pauses, then smiles and whispers, exceptions can be made. The dots connected my mind while driving home that day. White privilege exists. It was there all along. I grieve for generation seven. Their sensitivity derided, tenderness mocked, with education qualified, doors of opportunity are bolted, chained, and blocked. Resilience is their flake zone, resolution their creed, resistance their backbone is why they will succeed. Tender is their conscience, toughness at their core, toleration's recompense is why they push at freedom's door. And so I stand and cheer generation self.
During the day, she would bake cookies. When she saw the children walking home from school, she would lure them into her house and give them cookies and then ask them to teach her what, what they had learned in school. And that's how she learned how to read and write. And Paul Lawrence Spedler is buried in the, the Woodland Cemetery. If you've never been there, you've got to go take the tour of the Woodland Cemetery. There's a couple of things about this poem that I just want to explain. Uh, one is it mentions uh, segregated movie theaters. Almost all movie theaters, until, gosh, I want to say maybe the 50s, were segregated and black people watched from the balcony. And so lots of times there was a sign to that effect. Also, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have read or heard the title of the book, uh, Maya, Maya Angelou's book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Well, that comes from a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Okay, the home of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. You have to drive through Dayton, a city segregated by a river, to find the first black boy in America. Past movie theaters where a sign that read, colored, used to hang above the entrance to the balcony stairs. Past the office building where Dunbar worked an elevator, pressing his forearm on a lever to send it up and down all day, chatting with the white folks he ushered in and out of the sliding lattice door. Take the bridge to a neighborhood of broken windows and lonely storefronts advertising Jesus, to a yard with boxwoods bordering the porch to a home so neatly maintained that you expect at any moment to see a man in a black suit pull open the screen door and sit down in his rocker. A man who can tell you why the caged bird sings. So another thing about Dunbar, he graduated first in his class uh, and the only job he could get was as an elevator operator. Okay, uh, for those of you interested in writing, uh, I have two suggestions related to this poem, which is not in the anthology. Uh, one is you can write about the most ordinary things. At our table, we did a lot of talking about how you write about your pet, your dog, or cat, whatever. And then the other thing I would say is try to take something common like that and turn it upside down, find a new way of looking at it. Um, almost all poems work with inside a cliche. If you think about it, people start out writing love poems. Well, there's no greater cliche than a love poem. But you can always find a way to say something new in that. But anyway, this is a poem about uh, the dog. And there's a pun in it. That's another thing. I think almost all poems have some kind of word, like some kind of pun, pun in them. And in this poem, it's the spelling of God and dog. You know, spell God backwards and you get dog. And it turns the creation story upside down. That's why the creation story is the cliche. I tried to do something different by imagining what it would be like if God started out by creating the dog. The poem is titled, The Dog said. In the beginning, God said to dog, your name is mine in the mirror, so I grant you the next creation. And dog said, I would like someone to walk with me. So God made man with hardly any sense of smell and just two legs. And God said to dog, he has only a few words like come and fetch. And he knows little of the earth and its aromas. But let him totter along behind you and learn. Thank you. Kathy asked me very this. Of course, love to you. Uh, I encountered her poetry years ago. I've been reading her graciously ever since. Oh, he's a teacher, boys, and you 
tell me if you can't hear me. I'm going to read a poem from the book called No Ideas Except in Things, which is a famous quote from William Carlos Williams. It's probably the mantra of modern poetry. It says, you know, write about things, don't worry about the ideas. Write about the things and the ideas will come with it. So no ideas except in things. Today, I should be writing about the blue alphabet block that I carry in one hand. It bites into my palm, making it difficult to hold on to other things. But I want to write about the small animal asleep at my elbow, his fur holding my prints, the light undercoat showing through where I have rubbed him the wrong way. Are you reading symbolism into this? Good. Symbolism is rampant in our lives. Every day we are bludgeoned by its meaning. Only art can afford to be so. Outside, a night train sobs in the dark about distant misunderstandings, while the moon, that ancient setting, rises in debris like a watermark on an antique table. I am telling you, I believe, and if I believed in coincidence, luck, or fate, I could make a religion out of this. See how the light chooses one goblet but not the other? See how the water shivers at your touch? And I'm going to read a poem for Beth, because she's in the audience tonight. It's called Not Lost. The GPS thinks I am lost on these country roads, and it may be right, but I've been this way before, and I'm counting on landmarks to show me the way, even as the GPS girl recalculates my every turn. Soon, I will pass a family cemetery with a single look at you. I've always wanted to stop, but not today. Today, Beth has invited me to see the new lambs. It has been a hard winter, but the boss is still too fresh to be named. I'll come to see the world, that the world is still with us, even though others may have left it behind. Another mile, and I catch the Amish meeting house with the horse-drawn buggies tied up along the fence. But I am going farther, past the Stillwater Prairie, turning onto a twisted road, past the stone church, built on land too rocky to be grazed, suited only for steeples and tombstones. And now, as I turn into a gravel lane, I can hear the long, wavering cry of youths in their lands. Bah, and bah, and bah, they say, repeating the only words they need to know. I am here, I am not lost, and I belong to you. quietly in the place of nothing left to learn. And poetry, 
shelters the flightless bird and the legless creature whose only way to move is by thrusting forth directionless, searching to make merry missives, only to be dismissed as a haggling fool who gets lost on his way home from school and who has finally learned that there is much more he needs to know. The next poem, um, we have to talk about, me, comes from Herb and his line, this one just fell from the heavens. Sometimes it just, it's in our head, it's in our hearts, and we have to get it out. And this was one of those poems, I'll just read you my notes about it. These are reflections after an evening meal in Madrid in June of 2015. Um, the poem was great fun to create and came to me almost instantly. My husband and I were in Madrid visiting a friend, and we were in a very lively neighborhood, went to have dinner, and then went to bed, but there was a wedding down below, and I was laying in bed, it was almost impossible to sleep. And the poem just kind of came with the rhythm of the beat of the music of the wedding below us. And so I wrote it almost as it came out of my head. Um, the title is Pizzeria Cervantes, Madrid. Tight jeans, purse hooks, leather satchel, no hooks, skin showing, red bowl, drinks flowing, Maha Road. Jean jacket, your silk, suede fringe, no milk, tight space, some pay, small place, some stay. At the bar, sitting there, senorita, drinking here. Mother's son, run the place, nice smiles, weird space. Glassy dress, jet black, ponytail, pulled back, pie del oro, wavy hair, Long nose, Iberian flare. Spanish bistro, fake look, Italian fare, Chinese cook. Young lady, straight back, old guy, butt crack. <laughs> Waiter shouts through the door, una cerveza, por favor. Arizona in uh, the 
I get her to visit my sister in Tucson, and she lives on what was once a ranch, so that's the setting for this. It's called In the Near Distance. From the stable they call me, the yonder horses, vowels and consonants tumble over their big teeth, spill out their big mouths, nigger, nigger, whee! Across the way, the metal sludge, the sledgehammer, pings its end strike onto iron wrought into a lizard sculpture, poised to climb an adobe wall. <clears throat> the desert gods are generous today. Coo, coo, from a morning, from a dove morning night. Arizona sun, cool day, a ring of snow-topped peaks, rock and scrub, protect the tender valley. All this ranch here in the midst of thorned mesquite, it grabs and pierces, barrel cactus that lists a plump body to one side, old saguaro, arms upraised in supplication. Big sky protects this parched valley until rain puddles year-round now, while the blaze of sun drops in the far distance and the cold night brings the jubilation of stars. Sylvia Plath and Anna Sexton, to name just two. 
The wellspring of poetic inspiration is infinite and elusive. It could be anything, it could be everything. So sure, take the workshop, enroll in the master class. Learn about various poetic forms, voice, ways to play with language. But when it comes to inspiration, Maybe all you need to do is just open the fridge. <laughs> Oh, 
talk to you about this for about how many how many of you come from farm families? Good number of you. You know, I'm a city boy. And if I can find a poem, I'm gonna read about that too, but I, I've been fortunate enough to begin to learn about something that I knew nothing about. Uh, my wife's family had been farming in the area uh, for a long time. And with an outsider's eyes, I can pick up something new that at least astonishes me, and whether it does so for anybody else. Um, my poem from the book uh, reflects the fact that I, I hadn't found a new metaphor. Um, we're always having to trap a critter or two uh, before they, they destroy the foundations of the buildings that we have. And it's so frustrating to set the, set the live trap, because we always do, and end up catching one of the barn cats instead, because they just can't leave it alone, can they? So that's, that's my idea about writing poetry. So that's called patient writing or why poetry is like letting the cat out of the grandpa trap for the third time. <laughs> it always seems when you set a trap, you can't just trap what you set the trap to trap. It often happens other things wander in, hungry, curious, or immature. So it is with writing a poem, and when you caught an errant phrase or a too tame thought that's sprung your theme and stares at you now with sorrowful eyes through your measured bars, you must set it free. Be patient. Set your fancies bait once again in your meager trap. Lift and latch the thought trip door to possible worlds and wait your proper prey, your living bone, sleekly furred and sharp of tooth, may come. Ask one. It's nice to be last year and waste time. beside the tilling a fat groundhog who seemed to be smiling directly at him. But could that be? Then his left leg sank to the knee. From a freshly dug tunnel, just at his side, a blind clawed mole, earth kicking its hide, popped up just as his right leg sank. His shock was stark, his mind went blank. And then a worse blow bent his neck as hogweeds pressed him to the deck. But a poison hemlock filled his mouth, sickened. He could neither shout nor move as mare's tail bound his wrists and ankles tight with sudden twists. The earth itself began to roil 
and followed there is an angry soil rolling forward to the tiles, thence to the river. Half a mile. As he dropped into that deep and chilling cold, he felt a beat begin inside his failing brain. There came a voice as soft as rain that from that steady pulse was formed corn and beans, beans and corn. Too many years the earth has mourned your killing plans. Your greed has worn the life from land. Now comes the storm that washes clean. Now dawns a dawn, a, a dawn without your useless corn and beans, your chemicals, polluting streams. I'll wash you down into the sea where you'll never trouble me again. He heard. And as he sank into the rushing waters, dank and burnt rich deeps, his final thought, the real price, corn and beans and corn. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, have you had enough? Would you like to hear anything more? Because I know some of our poets have brought some other good stuff. No, I can see you have had it. I, what, I want to, what, what I want is to thank you all uh, for coming this evening. And I especially want to, want to thank the poets from the book for, for coming on out for this occasion. I hope you will have a number of other readings, but I doubt if we'll ever have an occasion as nice as this one is. Thank you.